All right. Hi, this is Valerie. Um, thank you very much for inviting us to uh, give, give you this uh, brief update on what's going on um, at NCBI and also uh, with the GRC. So I just have to say that today I'm going to be wearing both of my hats. Um, I am the lead for the, the GRC, GRC here at NCBI, and I'm also the project uh, lead for the development of our genome browser. So I'm going to be talking to you first about uh, GRC H38 and then about our genome browser. So let's see if I can get this to go. And let me bring up a uh, pointer for you. Um, so I want to just start by taking a moment to acknowledge that all the work that I'm going to tell you about is not just mine, but it really reflects um, the efforts of a lot of folks both within and outside the GRC. And so without all these folks, I'd really have nothing to tell you about GRCH38. Um, so the credit is theirs. And for those of you who aren't really familiar with the GRC, I'll just briefly mention that it's comprised of the five institutions uh, shown at the top of this slide here. And it became responsible for updating the Human Reference Assembly after the conclusion of the Human Genome Project. And we also handle mouse, uh, zebrafish, and chicken. And our job in the GRC is to do more than just fix problems, but it, our real aim is to keep the reference assemblies updated so that they reflect the new knowledge that we gain from their use, and then that way we can continue to use them to advance, you know, what happens in biology. Let's see if I can get this to go. Um, so today we're going to take a look at GRC H38, and when we get started, I want to make sure we review what the reference assembly represents because um, even power users of this resource often have a lot of misconceptions about what the reference is. So I'll make clear that what it is not is it's not the most common allele or haplotype, it's not the longest allele or haplotype, and it's also not the ancestral allele or haplotype. What the reference is is a representation of the clone-based sequence that happened to be available from the Human Genome Project. Um, it's a highly contiguous and accurate assembly, um, and it's also a haploid mosaic. And what that means, and this is important to know, is that while the overall assembly is a mix of haplotypes, each sequence component of the reference, because it's derived from a single clone, represents a single haplotype. And then we can tell, because we know where those components start and end, um, where all potential haplotype switches occur in the reference assembly. Now, even though the, the reference, the human reference, is the highest quality mammalian genome that's ever been produced, because you know, we're in the GRC, we tend to focus on the fact that it does still have some missing and misassembled sequence. And these issues can have really sort of dire consequences for genome interpretation. And you can see an example of that on this slide here, where um, in your, we have the sample that has gene one and gene two, and in the reference assembly, um, gene two is missing. Now, gene two can be missing either because um, it's an assembly error or because gene two is maybe polymorphic in the, the population. Uh, the outcome can be the same when we try to map reads from the sample to the reference. You know, in the best case scenario, the, whoops, yikes. We'll back that up. <laughs> There's the end of my talk. Um, in the best, you know, in the in the best case scenario, let's see if that stops. Yeah, you know, the reads from gene one align, and the reads from gene two don't align anywhere, and you can't then analyze gene two. But if gene two is related to gene one, you can end up with these off-target alignments that are now going to confound your analysis of gene one in addition to gene two, and so this can result in uh, variant undercalling in this region or you could even uh, potentially inappropriate call uh, paralogous sequence variants as allelic sequence variants. And so this really underscores the importance of uh, having a reference that represents all common human sequences, and that's one of the goals of the GRC. Okay, let's see where my slide went here. Okay, so in pursuit of uh, this goal of ours, um, we've at the GRC have developed this assembly model that has this mechanism to cleanly represent 
um, multiple haplotypes. And these are these alternate loci scaffolds that Terrence mentioned um, a little bit earlier. And what the alt loci do is that they allow the reference to contain these different representations for diverse or complex regions. And at the same time, we can still have these linear chromosomes that most users are comfortable with. And so an alt locus is really defined by its sequence, as shown here in orange, as well as its alignment to the chromosome. And that's what gives it its chromosomal context and defines the variation. So the current assembly isn't just a, a single haplotype representation or a diploid. It actually can contain many haplotypes. And if we go back to that previous um, slide, you can see how the model um, allows for better interpretation because now if you have the sample and you map to the full reference assembly, you're, and we have an alternate scaffold that has this gene 2 representation, we can get the appropriate mapping of the reads. So, you know, this is a slide showing the distribution of alt loci in GRCH38. And what I want to point out is that, in fact, GRCH37 also had alt loci. Um, but between 37 and 38, their number increased dramatically. So you can see here that they're really numerous. Um, they're widely distributed. And they also add considerable amounts of novel sequence uh, to the assembly. And so in addition to potentially having an impact on read alignment and variant calling, the alt loci also add value to the assembly uh, through their gene content. And in GRCH38, there are more than 150 genes whose only representation is on the alternate loci. So if you haven't even taken a look at these before, it's, you know, it's worth your time to just take a quick look at them, um, even in their sequence records, to see what's, what's in there. But you know, I'll point out that you know, I understand that if you're not ready to, to look at these, or um, we know that there are a lot of tools that aren't quite uh, able to handle the alt loci, I do want to emphasize to you that the GRCH38 chromosome assemblies are also a big improvement over 37. And so in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to point out to you um, some of those um, improvements and their impacts that they can have on, on gene representation and variant calling. So in this slide here, we are looking at a correction of the CDK11B gene from 37 to 38. And what you're seeing is here how the correction of this gene at this location here had an impact on the mapping of reads at the uh, CDK11A locus. So here in 37, we identified this collection of reads that had imperfect alignments to 11A in 37, that when we made the correction in 38, those reads now map with uh, perfect alignment uh, to the 11B locus. And in fact, our analyses that we've done have shown that about 4% of reads that map with imperfect alignments in 37 um, now map to a new location in 38. So this really shows you that uh, assembly updates can have impacts even you know, in unchanged regions. So this is what got changed, but we saw an impact over here in the unchanged region. Um, we also added uh, novel sequence to the chromosomes in 38, particularly that which includes genes. And we've got an example of that here. This is a case where we added a paralog of the KCNE1 gene, and this paralog was missing from 37. And so what you can see here is on the top the alignment of the, the paralog to the location in 38 where KCNE1 is. And if you zoom way in, you can see that there was a SNP called uh, at KCNE1. And that SNP is actually located at the position of a paralogous sequence difference. And this is important to note because this was a SNP that was previously defined as pathogenic. Um, it was a pathogenic missense variant, and it's cataloged in ClinVar. So you know, here's a place where a SNP might need reinterpretation in light of uh, 38 and the addition of this paralog to the assembly because we now know something more about this potential variant because of the sequence change that was made. So this is just one of many examples where vari variation analyses could benefit from using uh, the updated assembly. On this uh, next slide here, this is another example of a novel sequence addition where we're looking at the UCSC browser uh, from the GRCH37 assembly 
And you can see this really high density of SNPs in the 17P11.2 genomic regions, and they're associated with this KCNJ12 gene. And when you see this high density of SNPs, you probably know this is um, often suggestive of a missing segmental duplication. And on this slide here, you can see how this missing segmental duplication was partially addressed in 38. This gap adjacent region that's highlighted here in purple uh, is what got updated from 37 to 38. And you can see in the update that was made, again, we now added a, um, a related gene, KCNJ18, and it captures part of this missing segmental duplication. And then once again, if we go in and look at the alignment of the paralog, we can see a number of these uh, paralogous uh, sequence differences that are annotated at the locations of various SNPs. So again, sometimes SNPs need to be reinvestigated or, or variant calls in light of the, the updates to the assembly. We also made a uh, number of other types of updates going from 37 to 38 besides just novel sequence additions. Um, and one of these was um, an update of more than 8,000 individual bases. And they're just, you can see where these fall on chromosome 20 in this graphical view here. You can see they're scattered all along uh, the chromosome, and this looks very similar for the rest of the chromosomes. And I want to point out that these base updates were made specifically uh, to address error correction, or in some cases to address uh, issues with um, clinical interpretation or variant calling, and, and this wasn't done to meet some goal of a contrived reference, like I said before, of trying to always put in the longest or the most common allele. It was to address specific issues that were brought to our attention. You know, on this slide, you can see an example of a specific uh, base update, and this is in the Fibrillin-1 gene. Um, so on the top is 37, on the bottom is uh, 38, and you can see we put in a, a new sequence component and if you zoom in again at the location, um, you can see that there had previously been a SNP called at the location of this base update. And so this SNP, which I sort of put in air quotes, um, may not really represent actual population variation, but just all the calls that had been made on samples um, that differed from what was you know, previously an erroneous reference. So again, these are the sorts of things you, you want to be watching out for when you go from 37 to 38, because there are a lot of these improvements through there. So I'll just wrap up uh, this part of the talk by saying that in addition to the, the examples I gave you, GRCH38 has a number of features that make it superior to the, the prior assembly version. Um, there were more than 1,000 reported assembly issues that were resolved, and these included things like gap closures, uh, these targeted base fixes that I mentioned, and um, like I said before, included addition of missing paralogs. And all of this can have impacts on annotation, and Terrence already showed you a little bit how 38 is a better substrate for, for the gene annotation. It also allows for a better representation of uh, variation as well. And the details of these updates that got made are can be found in this uh, genome research publication that the GRC put out uh, the other year. Um, and so, I do want to say that, you know, despite all these improvements that, you know, are here, and I've got my favorite picture here that 38 is the best thing ever, um, the GRC does recognize that adoption of 38 um, is still ongoing. We know that moving data sets is not an insignificant effort, um, and there are a lot of challenges to working with the alt loci, such as, you know, a lack of general bioinformatics tools, and many of the file formats that we work with aren't really um, structured in such a way that they allow representation of um, multiple representations of a, of, of a genomic locus, um, and that that's kept a lot of people away. But I, I want to mention that, you know, that, that shouldn't, the alt loci shouldn't deter you from using 38. There were alt loci in 37, and people did a really phenomenal job of ignoring them for a number of years. Um, and, you know, the same can be said. <laughs> For GRCH38, I just showed you that there are lots and lots of improvements on the chromosomes, and it shouldn't be a case of, oh, I don't want to use 38 because I won't use the alt. No, use it without the alt, you will still gain the benefits from this. Um, and, you know, the, the tide is uh, starting to turn on 
this stuff in 2016 was when we started to see the growth in SRA submissions on 38 versus 37. There are still um, numerically more data on 37 than 38, but if you look at the growth rate of what's coming in, we're seeing sort of the new submissions on 37 trickling and the growth is really happening on 38. Um, and so with this ongoing planned migration of, you know, sort of allele frequencies that come from projects like Thousand Genomes and Exact to 38, we expect to see that happen even more. So before I move on to talk about our browser, I'll just briefly talk about sort of what's next because I also often have conversations with users who are afraid to move to 38 because they think that 39 is going to be around the, the corner. You know, they look at it and they say, well, they got to 37 with 13 patch releases. They're at 38 and 12 patch releases. Clearly, it's time for 39. And this statement that's up here is the official statement of the GRC right now regarding what's going on with our assembly curation efforts. And the GRC is persisting. We are continuing to improve the, the reference, you know, dealing with these errors and adding these new alternate sequence representation so that we have a reference that really provides a complete representation of the human genome. But for now, we're only going to make these updates publicly available as patch releases, but we have indefinitely postponed our next coordinate changing update of 39 while we're in the process of working with the research community to evaluate new models and sequence content. So this is where I'm sort of alluding to graph genomes and uh, large population sets of high quality genomes to get uh, haplotypic representations. So we're actively um, engaging with groups that are, that are doing this sort of work and we're looking at this, but while all this goes on, 39 is not scheduled and we, you know, it's an indefinite postponement for now until we see what the new model is going to look like. But the patch releases are getting you these additional sequences and we'll show you places where we know that we can correct the assembly. So with that, I'm going to change hats and talk about uh, the Genome Data Viewer, or GDV, which is the NCBI Genome Browser, and I'm going to talk about it as a tool that you can use to evaluate data in the context of GRC H38. And so from our landing page uh, to this browser, the URL is down here at the bottom of the screen. You can select both your organism and uh, assembly of interest, and we support uh, more than 600 different assemblies from a wide variety of taxa right now, but for human, we do have support for both 37 and 38, so you can look at both of those. Um, I'll mention that GDV is built from a series of widgets that are um, many of these that you can use for sort of variant interpretation. And I'm going to just on this slide here highlight a few of them that I'll be talking about in the next couple of minutes. Um, some of these I won't have time to get to, but I'll point out that there is a uh, YouTube playlist um, for several of these widgets. Uh, so if you use Track Hubs or you like to upload your own data into the browser, there's a great three-minute video on that. We also have really robust integration with BLAST here at NCBI, and there's another three-minute video that you can watch to learn about that. But the widgets I'll just briefly talk about are the sequence viewer, which is where you do your display and configuration of tracks, our search widget where you can navigate to your uh, location of interest, as well as this assembly regions detail uh, widget, which helps you uh, navigate to those alternate loci that I spent so much time talking about and see the RefSeq annotation that Terrence mentioned that's, that's on those. So, um, moving in to look at GDV a little bit more closely, um, within GDV you can use this search widget to search by a gene name, a phenotype, location, or a dbSNP um, identifier. Uh, we provide all sorts of search examples here to help you create your, you know, know what you can create queries for. So again, here you can see a, like a dbVar um, study as well. Um, in this slide, I did a search for the APOE gene. Um, your matching results show up in a little table in the widget, and the uh, graphical view updates to the right location. And our default view for GDV includes uh, some of these RNA-seq 
uh, tracks that are the RNA-seq data that contribute to the annotation for the gene track. So this is a great way to start looking at the underlying support for the RestSeq annotation. Within this display, you know, this is not dissimilar to anyone who's used UCS Your Ensemble. You can uh, pan left and right. You can click and drag within the view to zoom. We also have uh, tools on the, uh, the header that allow you to do the same kind of thing. You can delete tracks by clicking on these X buttons on the side, and you can also do drag and drop reordering of the tracks. Under this tools uh, button that's up here at the top right, um, you'll find options so that you can set markers within the view. Um, you can download FASTA, and you can create PDFs for any publications along with a whole bunch of other tracks, do primer design, stuff like that. More detailed configuration of the display is done through this tracks menu here to the, the right. If you go in there, uh, you can access a feature I want you to know about that's known as track sets which basically gives you one-click configuration of the GDV display. The track sets are essentially preset display configs that include these high-value tracks for several different types of analyses. So you can see here just um, a number of these different uh, track sets that we have, and some are designed for doing clinical analyses, others for more uh, genes and variation. There's even one that will help you sort of look at the state of the assembly at a given location. So if you're wondering if there's a problem, the GRC provides information in, in tracks as well. Um, so these, this is a great way to do easy updates, but you can also do um, custom configuration with this configure tracks option. Um, so we've got this big menu here with tracks. There are tabs here on the side that have various groupings for these. You can drag and drop um, the, the track names in here to set your display. And the nice thing is once you've created a display configuration that you like, if you've got a My NCBI account, you can save that configuration in there and next time you come back to the, the browser, you can go to My NCBI track collections and again do a one-click load to, to get your display back up there. Um, just in the last two slides I've got, um, I'll point out just some specific uh, tracks and display features that GDV has that you might find uh, of use if you're evaluating uh, variants um, or if you're in the process of migrating from one assembly version to the other. So on the top here, if you're moving from 37 to 38, you'll find that we have uh, some tracks that allow you to see differences between the two assemblies. One of these is this assembly difference graph, which is really just a heat map that shows you the differences between the two assemblies, so at a very zoomed out level, you can look at a chromosome and sort of get a sense of what's the same and what's different between one version and the next, so the darker color means things are more different. Um, but if you really want to drill down into the details, we also include a track of the assembly assembly alignments between 37 and 38, and this track will allow you to drill down all the way to the base pair level to see how at any given location the two assemblies differ from one another. So again, if you're looking at specific variants, this is a really useful track to turn on so you can see if something has changed between assembly versions that might impact uh, your interpretation. If you are interested in using any of these alternate loci, there is also an alignment track that shows you the alignment of the alternate loci to the chromosome. So again, you can see exactly down to the base pair level how these representations uh, differ from one another. And I mentioned this assembly regions details widget a little bit earlier. Um, this is a great tool because it shows you, um, if you're looking at any region of the genome, whether there is an alternate locus scaffold or a patch for that region. So you can just look down into this widget and see if there's any data in this row. And you can then click on that row and it will update the browser display to take you to that um, scaffold representation where you can see all that RefSeq annotation. Uh, lastly, I'll just mention there are some tricks and tips you might find useful in GDB for looking at variation. Um, we have a large number of variant tracks available in our uh, tracks menu over here. Um, these are made available from dbSNP and dbVar as well as from ClinVar. Um, and so you might be particularly interested in the ClinVar short variations tracks and the cited uh, variants track. Um, there are Tool tips 
So these tracks are listed right here in the browser. You can see that they sort of, you can use them to align up with the typical DB SNPs, all SNPs uh, track and align that with your, your gene annotation. And the tool tips for these tracks have links back to ClinVar and to PubMed so that you can get more information about these particular SNPs in those resources. So the browser is a really nice way to sort of get a, an overview of variation in the region and the annotation and then link back to other NCVI resources for additional details. Lastly, I'll just mention that the genes track um, also lets you see uh, SNPs projected from features, um, like the transcripts and the CDSs. And you can turn these on through that uh, configuration menu under tracks that I mentioned before. And if you go down to the track setting, you can find a rendering option to show all, which will get you the transcripts and the CDSs. And then you can turn on this projection. So again, you can see right here these SNPs right on the gene track. So that may be helpful to you in your variation analysis. And so that's all I wanted to say really about GDV um, and just to acknowledge the fact that we had a bunch of people who were also involved in the production of this tool.